Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the Renaissance Society Forum. We have an inspiring topic today. It's called Accepting and Adapting to Your Disabilities. And our guest is the former mayor of Sacramento, Heather Fargo. As a reminder, the um, presentation today is being recorded and you can access it by going to the Renaissance Society Forum channel on YouTube or the Renaissance Society website. Now, if you have a question during the presentation today, you can go to the Q&A icon at the bottom of your screen and enter that question in the text box. Uh, we will address that question toward the end of the presentation and answer as many questions as possible. However, please note that the chat function has been disabled. If you would like, you can disable or enable the closed captioning by going to the live transcript icon at the bottom of the screen. And it is there that you can also adjust the size of the subtitles if you like. As I mentioned, Today's presenter is the former mayor of Sacramento, Heather Fargo. She was mayor of Sacramento from 2000 to 2008. Prior to that, she served as a member of the Sacramento City Council for 11 years. Ms. Fargo is currently president of the Capital Women's Campaign, which helps guide Sacramento women to expand their political and financial power. Last year, Heather Fargo chaired the Neighborhoods Against Strong Mayor campaign to defeat Measure A. Now, more than 25 years ago, Heather Fargo was diagnosed with multiple sclerosis. So today, she'll be discussing the challenges of dealing with MS, the aging process, and the impacts they have had on her life and how she's managed to stay engaged in her community and in local politics. She will also describe the physical and psychological tools that she has used to stay active and relevant. And of course, that would include the importance of her friends on a strong sense of humor, her focus on her health, and the importance of staying busy. And so it's my pleasure right now to introduce to you the former mayor of Sacramento, Heather Fargo. Well, thank you, Bob, for that very kind introduction. And thanks to the Renaissance Society for inviting me here today uh, and to all of you for being in the audience today. I, I hope I can answer some of your questions as we go through this, uh, through this discussion. And uh, it's my pleasure to be here with you today. Um, so the topic of accepting and adapting to your disabilities is one that I've had a little bit of experience with, um, but I imagine there are many people in the audience who have as well. Um, it's not as hard as it sounds because we've kind of been doing it our whole life. There was already always someone who could run faster and jump higher, who could read better or speak better or uh, throw the ball farther. Uh, we've always had some things that we did better than others and some things that others did better than we did. I think the main difference with having um, a physical disability and a chronic disease is that uh, it's permanent and it's only going to get worse. So it isn't that it's uh, you know a broken leg you get you you have to deal with and then recover from and go on. So my story, uh, very briefly, uh, born in 1952. So I'm a baby boomer. Um, I had a pretty I think traditional childhood. I was the middle kid of three. Um, I did have back surgery at 18 to correct uh, scoliosis and had eight of my vertebrae fused, uh, and stayed in a body cast for a year. So that was my first real major physical issue that I had to, to deal with and wasn't a lot of, lot of getting around it in a, in a body cast, but I did get beyond it and uh, got very active uh, after that. Um, I went on to get my uh, bachelor's degree at UC Davis in environmental planning and management. I went to work for state parks where I stayed for uh, over 25 years. Um, and I got involved, moved to Sacramento in 79, got involved in the community, uh, ended up helping to form the community association, uh, and then ultimately uh, sued the city of Sacramento and won, which kind of launched my political career. Uh, got elected to Sacramento City Council in 79, and then was elected mayor in 2000. So in the middle of that is kind of when my MS story started. Uh, I got diagnosed in 1995 
uh, in December after a community meeting uh, is when I got my first symptoms. Uh, and I had what, that, what is called relaxing remitting MS at the time, which means it came and went, uh, or went and came back. Uh, and I had a, a different symptoms, um, but for the most part, it was gone for the first 10 years. It would be with me for a month or, or so, and then it would be gone for a year. So I didn't um, have to share it, even though I was living a very public life at that point. I didn't really share with very many people that I had MS, wasn't really sure because you never know exactly what's gonna happen with it. So wasn't sure I ever was going to have to tell anybody. Uh, but then um, but in the middle, uh, what about 2005, I, I uh, broke a bone in my foot, used a cane for a while and kind of never got over that, kind of had to continue to use the cane and had some ongoing back issues. Um, and then I started being a little bit more stumbly. Uh, and as a public official, you either have to admit you're drinking all day long and, and <laughs> drunk in public, or you have to admit that there might be something else wrong with you. Um, and so about 2007 is when I made a public announcement about my MS, uh, made the front cover of the B. Um, most people accepted it pretty well. I had a pretty positive response for most people. Um, and I did try for, for a third term in 2008, uh, which wasn't to be, I, I lost. Uh, but I went on to continue to work uh, for a couple more years um, as the executive director of the Strategic Growth Council for the state. Uh, I'm still working part-time for the Sacramento Tree Foundation. And of course, I continue to stay involved uh, here locally, politically, um, uh, in both campaigns as, as well as different organizations. So getting back to the MS and the disability, I basically have gone from using a cane to using a wheelchair or a scooter um, in about 10 years. So question of the day is how did I accept it and how did I adapt to it? Uh, and it's not always easy, as many of you know, because it's, um, it's hard to be graceful sometimes and gracious when you're disabled. Um, and, but you know, you do the best you can. I feel I do the best I can with what I have. And I tell all the young people I know to do it while you can because you never know. Uh, you might get MS, you might get something else. You're going to get something. As we all know, nobody gets out alive. So everybody gets something and everybody starts losing their abilities as they age. And it's, it's not fun, but it's something that you do have to deal with. Um, my current symptoms are I have a fair amount of numbness in my feet and occasionally in my hands. Um, I have difficulty walking, uh, great difficulty taking stairs. I use a cane for stairs. Uh, I have some balance issues. And of course, like most people with MS, I have depression. So I deal with all of that in a number of different ways. Um, I usually use a walker around the house and in the garden uh, and on short trips, um, you know, if I'm going from a parking space to a restaurant, uh, which I can't wait to do more of, um, I use my walker. But then I also have um, a wheelchair I use in the house if I'm having a bad day or just don't want to get myself worn out. Um, and because I also have drop foot, I forgot to mention that. That's one of the symptoms of MS, of difficulty of walking is my right foot really doesn't want to cooperate anymore. It's still here, but it's not, um, it doesn't take part in everything. Um, and I do have occasional falls, I should probably also mention. Um, so I've, um, you know, I've, I've tried the shots, I've tried the infusions, I've tried a variety of, of pills, all to try to keep the MS from, from getting worse because there is no cure for MS. Uh, it's a, a disease of the um, central nervous system. So it can affect all kinds of things from, you know, your brain to everything connected to your spinal column, which is kind of most of your body. Um, and you never really know what it's going to affect. Uh, for me, mostly it's from the waist down, it's my legs, it's my balance, and it's the depression. Um, so I have added hand controls in my car, which I was advised to do before I needed them, and I did, and I think that's very wise. If you need hand controls or think you might, I'd get them before you completely need them because they're not as intuitive as you may think they are. <laughs> Bit of a challenge. Um, I also got myself a chairlift um, in the back. I have an historic home, so I've got eight stairs to my porch either porch and so I have a lift in the back which I use so I don't have to drag myself up or down the stairs. 
Um, I do watch my diet and try to pay attention to my attitude because that matters a lot. Um, I do the exercises that I can, which isn't too many, but I, you know, the goal here is to stay mobile. Um, I was doing warm water pool therapy uh, at a place called Sim America in Davis, which was wonderful. It's a very warm pool, um, aerobic exercises, and it's the one place where I can actually move for an entire hour. I can't I can't walk for an hour, I can't walk for 10 minutes, but, um, but over there I could actually exercise, move, stretch, um, walk you know, in the pool. Um, and I'm very much looking forward to getting back into that. That was probably of all of the, the physical exercise things I've done, that's been the most effective for me. Um, I also go to a physical therapist um, either weekly or every other week. And uh, she's a different kind of physical therapist. She doesn't just work with muscles. She's a craniosacral therapist. Uh, and so she works with my brain, with my spine, uh, tries to keep my lymph system from being blocked, works on my veins and arteries and nerves if things get tangled. Uh, and it's a bit of magic, um, but it, it works. And I almost always leave there feeling taller, feeling taller and lighter than when I went in. Um, and she's been just very effective for me. So uh, that has been very helpful. My, my kind of whole healthcare team is not only my primary care doctor, who's very good, but I have a neurologist, of course, a urologist, um, a physical therapist, a masseuse, I believe in massage, um, and, an, and a chiropractor occasionally, especially if I take a fall, that is a, a quick way to get back in alignment, although my physical therapist can do it as well. Um, but with MS, and I think with any chronic illness, uh, it's not just the physical adaptations and the physical uh, effort that you make. It's also very emotional, psychological, um, you know, it's a mental battle uh, to deal with it because it's not something you want. Um, it, there's a lot of grief involved because of the loss. So you have to grieve that loss. You have to acknowledge it, um, but you don't have to like it. Um, I don't go that far. So, you know, the stages of grief of, you know, of denial, uh, of acceptance, um, well, the anger comes in between. So and actually the anger comes and goes. So you have the denial, which I big believer in denial, use it as long as you can. Um, and then of course, you know, you get mad about it, you finally accept it and you figure out how to deal with it. Um, so denial, of course, only works for so long. Um, and now that I pretty much have accepted my losses, I still grieve for them. I still miss walking. Uh, I miss being able to garden for a whole day. I even miss vacuuming without falling over. Um, so I even miss precinct walking. <laughs> so there's things that, that I used to do that I just can't physically do anymore. Uh, but there are a lot of things that I can still do, and I try to focus on that. Um, my physical battle, of course, is to stay vertical, to stay mobile, uh, to reduce pain, to stay as active as I can. Um, and then, of course, as many of you know, with chronic illness and with loss of mobility, there's a financial burden. Uh, and th because a lot of the things that you really want and need are not going to be covered by your insurance or by Medicare. Uh, they don't cover lifts to get to your back door. I think they just assume you're going to move to an old folks home. They do not cover hand controls in cars. Uh, they don't cover the best scooters. They don't cover the best wheelchairs. Um, and there are bad ones of those. Um, basically, I think Medicare cares if you can get from your bed to the bathroom or the kitchen and beyond that. They really don't care if you can get out of your house. You know, they don't pay for a ramp at the front door or any of those kinds of things. And I frankly, I think they should, or somebody should, uh, or you need to plan ahead of time and make sure that you get that done. But, um, but one of the things for me is that I really um, have a good sense of humor and I really want to um, continue to have that. And so I do my best to have fun. Uh, and that's, um, I now call my form of comedy sit down comedy because I can't do stand up anymore. Um, just a little joke for you. Um, but I have a lot of good friends who also like to have fun and I get to do fun things with them. I have pets, which I consider fun. I have a garden, which I love. Uh, I wish I could, could do more in it, but I get out there when I can and do what I can. Um, I got myself a lightweight scooter. 
and it's called a travel scoot. If you want to look it up, that's travel scoot. Um, and it's online. You can only buy it online. You can't ever test it out. So I have taken it to several people for them to test it, just like someone brought it to me for me to test it. But because it's so lightweight, um, it's 35 pounds with everything put together. If you take out the battery uh, and take off the seat, it's well under 30 pounds. It's probably more like 25. And it folds up. So it used to fit in my Honda Accord trunk. I now have a Honda Element, which has been very handy because I can easily get my walker out of the back seat and I can easily, with my friends, put the scooter in the back of it so I can leave it set up in between using it. Um, and so getting a new vehicle was, of course, as important as getting hand controls. I think it, it has worked very well for me. But I use that scooter so I can go to the farmer's market which um, has now the one that I go to was under the freeway and it's now over um, you know, by Sears. So if you haven't visited it lately, it's worth a visit. It's a wonderful market. Um, I love going to the market. I love the antique fair. Um, I love going to special events and just out and about, you know, getting on the trails, getting on the walkways, getting on things that are accessible. Um, and then the other thing I do, which for me has always been important, is I just try to do things that I think are meaningful and I try to stay relevant. And I think staying relevant is just as hard in the aging process as it is with disabilities because we're taken less and less seriously as we get older, I believe. Um, but I feel it's part of my job to speak up on behalf of other people who can't be or aren't as outspoken as me. Uh, when I see issues or uh, places that don't uh, that aren't ADA accessible or that um, or there isn't enough, I certainly speak up and make sure people think about the impact of what they have offered or what they're doing. Um, it's just amazing to me to go into a hotel where the shower is, it's an accessible one, I can walk in, but it's slick, there's nothing to hold on to, there's no chair, I don't know what they're thinking. Um, beds that are too high to get into, stairs without handrails, um, it's just an amazing thing to me. I just wonder why they don't test anything anymore. You go into a, a you know, a, a hotel room for people that are disabled and the chair is a swivel chair that won't stay solid enough for you to put your shoes on. It's, it's very interesting to me to have seen all of this, but um, part of doing things meaningful is I'm also on the board, I serve on the board of the Northern California chapter um, of the National MS Society. Um, and so part of what I do there is advocacy work. And one of the things we were successful in getting two years ago, uh, which is still going on, we were able to get a $5 million um, piece of the state budget that allows uh, the area agencies on aging to provide ramps and rail handrails and those kinds of things uh, in people's homes in seniors who are disabled uh, who can't afford it. And so that was, I think, very meaningful to me in terms of a success to, to be able to make the case and, and get the funding because it really does matter. Um, we're currently working on no surprise billing and making sure that um, that also dealing with the cost of, of insurance uh, or the cost of, of pharmaceuticals, I mean. Um, my, uh, the average cost of MS in, uh, medicine, by the way, is now up to about 85,000 a year, um, which really no one can afford. So it's kind of absurd. Uh, most insurance companies will pay for one or the other, but sometimes they're picky about which one they're willing to pay for and they don't all work the same. So we have those kinds of arguments. Um, I go back to Washington still uh, on my scooter uh, and advocate uh, for people who are disabled uh, through the MS Society and do that here in Sacramento as well. In fact, our state action day is Monday coming up. Um, so it does help when you're stubborn. I think it helps to be vocal. Um, and of course you need to be creative because you're always trying to work around whatever it is you can't do as easily as you used to do. Um, and I also find for me anyway, that it helps me if I help others. Uh, if I donate food, money, clothing, um, use my voice for other people, all of those things matter to me um, it's because I'm trying to make a difference. I'm still very engaged in the community. I call 311 on a regular basis. Um, I write, uh, I vote, um, I advocate, I donate, I teach. Um, and I think most people have something that that they can leave behind. Um, you have time, talents, and treasures, and your your job is to figure out how to best use those to make a difference. And by making that difference, you then make your life better as well. Um, 
So that's really a challenge is how do we make the world a better place? Um, I do it in part to the MS Society. Uh, the Capital Women's Campaign, which I help fund, is really all about electing more women and making sure that women find their voice to, to speak out on what needs to be done to help the inequities that women are facing. Uh, I also work with the Nationalist Political Caucus. I'm uh, the vice president of the local uh, chapter here with uh, Lauren Hammond as the president. I'm a member of our local garden and art club. Uh, we're trying to develop a garden and art center here in Atomas and uh, working with them on gardens and art is, is a very powerful and, and positive thing to do. And I work part-time for the Sacramento Tree Foundation, uh, working in under canopied neighborhoods in Sacramento, trying to, again, uh, reduce the disparity between neighborhoods that have and neighborhoods that don't. Um, so those are some of the ways that, that I fight to be relevant. Um, and, as, and I think, again, as I said, the, the aging process brings with it disabilities, regardless of whether you have something like MS on top of it. Um, so the world has changed. Uh, the world is changing around us, as you all know. Uh, and there are certainly some things that I don't want to learn. Uh, so this problem with being disabled is that you actually feel like you're aging more quickly than everyone around you, than other people your age. And, and in a way you are because you're losing things more quickly than they are. Um, but I just tell them I'm testing the equipment for them. Someday they're going to need a walker or a wheelchair or a scooter. Um, and I have a pretty good idea now of which ones to get and which ones not to get. Um, I just tell my friends I'm testing it. Um, and buying equipment is also a challenge because there really isn't anyone to go to who knows. Uh, you can go to the salesman and they might try to sell you the most expensive one or the one that they carry. Um, certainly doctors and nurses and, and people in the healthcare industry have no clue uh, how to open a, a walker sometimes, let alone which one is best. Uh, and I have bought bad walkers, I have bought bad wheelchairs, um, and I even bought bad canes. And it's interesting to me that those items are out there. And so I try to tell people which ones work and which ones don't work so that, um, so that I can share that information. And that's certainly something that I think, um, you know, it's like a new expertise. And I, I want to encourage people who, who have a disease or who have a problem uh, that they've overcome uh, to share that expertise with others that need it, because there are other people that need to know what you know. Uh, and I think that that, that is, uh, that's very important. Uh, I obviously don't know what the future is going to hold for me. I don't know whether I'm going to get worse or not, uh, or whether or not I will need more assistance. Um, I think that the average right now, the average life that, uh, that you lose by having MS is maybe five years of your lifespan. Uh, both of my grandmothers lived to be about 100, so I'm not too worried about those last five years, um, having seen what they look like. Um, but, you know, you have this new expertise, and I think that it's really important to, to teach other people how to do it. Um, traveling, for example, when people are new to being disabled, they don't know they can go to the front of the line, but you can. Um, they don't know that you get to go on the airplane first, but you can, and you can take anybody with you who's traveling with you. Um, there is an organization I've recently discovered last year, and I haven't been able to use them yet, called Sage traveling, Sage Traveler, uh, and that is an organization uh, that helps uh, organize tours for people who are disabled and in wheelchairs and have mobility issues. And they make sure wherever you travel uh, that you have a clear path to go and that you will be in a hotel which is clearly accessible, uh, that doesn't have a bed that's too tall to get into, um, and doesn't have you know a bathroom with a step, which the hotel thinks is accessible. Um, it, it's pretty amazing what's out there and what we need to continue to lobby for. But I think, you know, the bottom line is to it, that I have used, I've always been busy, but stay engaged, uh, work on what you think is important, uh, do what you think is meaningful, um, you know, donate, tip big, um, you know, hire your, your friends, kids, so they can have an income if they need one. Um, just do what you can to make a difference. Uh, 
do what you have to do to, to continue to be active uh, and relevant uh, because you are and you still have things to offer. And I guess that will really be when I give up is when I think I can't really be a part of this world anymore and make a difference. But, um, but I still think that I can and that I am. Um, and I appreciate the opportunity today to talk to all of you. Uh, one of the things that I also do is that I fundraise and coming up uh, this, well, next week, next Saturday, of course, uh, not tomorrow, is our annual MS walk. And so later on after the question and answer period, there'll be a slide which will show you how you can sign up to be a part of the virtual MS walk um, and or donate to at the MS Society, which helps not only fund research, uh, but also helps to provide services and programs to people who are suffering from MS. So um, I think that's about all the wisdom that I have to share with you at this point, other than that I am uh, very happy, happy to answer the questions that you have for me. So I think with that, I will turn it over to Tom, who is going to help to gather your questions, which hopefully you've put some in the question and answer box and hopefully I'll be able to answer them. So again, thank you for this opportunity. Tom? Well, that was great, Heather. Thanks so much. You have enlightened many of us in terms of uh, what we all can expect to happen sooner or later. Um, we do have some questions. So I think we'll start off with, uh, uh, this is from uh, Anonymous. Uh, she's undoubtedly anonymous. Uh, how easy is it for someone in Sacramento to get around downtown in a wheelchair? Ah, that's a really good question. It's actually one of my current pet peeves. I've done a little bit of working on some of the issues related to disabilities uh, in Sacramento. Um, I think it's a bit of a challenge. Um, there's a lot of curb cuts, which are good. Uh, there are still some areas where the curb cuts, and that's the area at the corners where you go down and, and cross. Uh, most of those are okay um, in, in downtown proper. You get into Midtown and South Side, it gets a little bit trickier. Um, I think some of the problems that I have found recently, um, and frankly, I don't feel as welcome in the central city as I used to. Uh, and that's because there has been such an effort to get people out of their cars um, that they've added, you know, those green bike paths and they've separated the parking in some areas um, for, from the sidewalk. So you have to park basically in the street, open your car door into a lane of traffic, get out, walk around your car, walk over the back path to the curb and then get up on the curb onto the sidewalk. I find that very challenging. Um, and they've also eliminated a lot of the parking because they wanted people to be able to eat outside and make it easier for people who live in Midtown to have a good time, which I'm sure they do. Um, but those bike trails I find very troubling. Um, the good news is there's lots of pedestrian activated signals. Um, and so, it, so it's, it's definitely possible. I would definitely, I definitely don't do it alone. I try to do it with friends um, because I think it, it can be scary. And when you're in a wheelchair, you're also a lot shorter. And the reality is people don't see you in a wheelchair. The good news is it's gonna hurt the car a lot if they hit my scooter or my wheelchair or my walker. Um, but um, you know, you're still a little bit at risk, but it's, it's better than a lot of cities because it's flat and because there's been a lot of investment by the city that started when I was there and has continued ever since to try to make Sacramento a more, a more walkable city. I just think that with the addition of the scooters and the bikes, uh, they've made it more challenging for those of us that have difficulty walking. So there's, there's quite a few places where they're um, accommodating for the blind. And when they have crosswalks, there's often those big yellow blocks that have these big bumps in them. Is that yeah. difficult to uh, negotiate with a wheelchair? Um, it rattle your brain? They're probably, yeah, they're a little difficult with a the wheelchair. They're actually very difficult with a walker because the walker stops, gets stopped on them. And so uh -huh. um, I, you know, if I, we ever them? get some of the things off of our to-do list, maybe we will try to get the, the ADA change to make what they have done for the blind work better for those of us that aren't blind but have other disabilities because right. those those yellow patches are very difficult and troubling. Okay, good. Uh, another question from Anne. Uh, she would like to just to repeat the uh, physio uh, 
cranial psychotherapist. Yeah, it's it's yeah. called a craniosacral physical therapist. So it's okay. C R A N I O, meaning you know the brain, cranium. Uh, sacral is the back. S A C R A L. And if you go online and look at the Up Ledger Institute, that's U P L E D G E R. The Up Ledger Institute is where one of the places that my physical therapist was trained, and they actually have a directory of physical therapists nationwide that have been through their training, and you can look them up and see what kind of training they got. So if you look up Up Ledger Institute, uh, they're based. I don't know, Virginia or Tennessee, somewhere in the South, uh, a physical therapist developed, took what he knew about physical therapy and did more research. And so there, it's a very soft touch. You know, they can tell where your nerve is coming out of your brain and attaches to your left foot and they can figure out how. To me, it's very magical, but it's also incredibly effective. Great, so. great. We've got a lot of questions here for you. Um, how do you deal with constant pain? Well, the good news is I don't have constant pain because that is incredibly difficult to deal with, I believe. Um, I look like I'm in more pain than I'm actually in. Um, I, although sometimes I do have pain. And if I have pain, I mean, I tend to try to relieve it by getting the weight off of my feet, off of, I have one foot in particular that I have a lot of pain. I still have some back pain. But if I lay flat, uh, put heat on my back, um, you know, I, I can relieve that pain, you know, put my knees up with some assistance and kind of relieve it. Um, and then, of course, I take aspirin with coffee for headaches and I take ibuprofen if I'm having a muscular thing. And I take three of them because that's the therapeutic dose. But but I don't take any pain medication on a daily basis. I, I don't have regular daily pain, which I'm very grateful for. I, right. I've had phases of it, but I don't have it right now. So. Okay. Here's another one. Uh, there have been attorneys suing small businesses that can't afford to make physical changes in their buildings. Can you suggest a way to help get the business uh, businesses buildings changed without fines and fees? Most of the of the of the costs of that are the cost of the physical changes to the building, um, and not so much the fines and the fees. I think, but I. I, one way to do it, I mean, if if the city that you were in was interested, they could, you know, waive permit fees if somebody was improving a building for accessibility. I mean, there is the law which requires it that's been in place for 20 years. Um, the one that actually broke my heart was when Squeeze In got sued uh, because the reality, I mean, I have, there's some things that I, I think absolutely should be accessible. Then there's other situations where, you know, the business has been around for a while and there's a way they can make an accommodation for me, I'm fine. I was fine having them bring my burger to me in their outdoor eating area. I didn't need to go inside and sit on the stool. Yeah. Um, and that was really the issue with squeeze in. And I thought it was very unfair to them. So, um, you know, I, I, there are I, the guy who, who was doing all of that litigation ended up going to jail himself, I think for tax evasion. So, um, <laughs> You know, we, we all have challenges. I don't know of anybody that, that's actually going around and suing our city right now. Maybe that is still happening. But the city of Sacramento, when I was there, we had a, a major settlement with an organization that had sued us over um, inaccessible issues with sidewalks. And we ended up with, we're still, I believe the city is still spending several million dollars a year on curb cuts and improvements to make the city more walkable and and, and when it's more walkable, it's also more rollable. And um, so hopefully that that's still going on. And if there's anybody who lives near a an area where they need a curb cut, if you let the city know, they have the funds to come and fix that. Oh, great. Okay, good advice, thanks. Uh, here's one from Cindy. Do you have a support system at home? Yes, I have cats and a dog and a husband uh, and very good neighbors and lots of good friends. So in which uh, order? In which order? <laughs> uh, <laughs> it varies. It varies. Um, my okay. husband is very good to travel with. He's very accommodating that way. He's very handy. So he gets, you know, he gets things done that I need to get done. And um it's been interesting with COVID because there have been some changes 
Um, first of all, a lot of lot more people now know what it's like to be stuck at home. So, um, so that is something which um, you know, which I think is good and eye opening. And there have been some improvements. For example, my husband used to always do our grocery shopping, and he that started when I was mayor because I couldn't get in and out of a grocery store quickly. Uh -huh. um, so he and he got used to it, and he likes it. He knows the people at the store. He likes it more than I do. But I've been doing the you know going online and ordering it and having it ready for a pickup lately, and that's been a just a godsend that's made life much more easy to to get that's things great. that i want so, um let's yeah. see the support system is very important and, and i kind of i mean life is a journey and get having ms is too and i have a couple of very good friends who also have ms we have very different um different symptoms but the fact that i have someone i can call to who understands what i'm dealing with is is really important that's and, great I think it's better for that person to not be the person you live with at home. <laughs> yeah. This one's from Jackie. Heather, how, um, you are an inspiration for us. How do you okay. manage your episodes of depression? Well, I mean, I, I am on an antidepressant and actually I think it should be in the water. I just think we should cut to the chase and put antidepressants in the water for everybody. <laughs> um, but um you know, what I do is, is I try to not, um, I try to, to get back in the mix. I mean, I try to go out and do something. I try to, you know, I call on a friend to go out and, you know, go out to eat, go for a drive, you know, get in the garden. The garden helps. Nature helps. That's um, those are the main things I do. Okay, good. Uh, what kind of symptoms, this is from Jack. Uh, what kind of symptoms led you to know something was off? Did your did your jaw ever go numb, and how did your how was your vision affected? Actually, my vi the good news is it has not affected me from the neck up that anyone has told me yet. <laughs> um, so I don't have any of the cognitive issues or the vision issues, and my jaw never. Obviously, I'm still talking up a storm. Um, so I didn't get that effect. What, I, what happened to me is I had been in a community meeting uh, and I was sitting on a, on a bench talking to, um, to one of my constituents. And when I went to get up, I noticed that my left leg was asleep and it stayed asleep for a week or so. Mm -hmm. um, and then it went to the right leg and my right leg started being asleep. And then that's when I thought, okay, I must have something wrong. And I'm fortunate. I have a brother-in-law uh, who's a doctor. I called him and said, what do you think I should do? And he said, you should, probably should go see a neurologist. And so he arranged for me to, to go see a neurologist. And uh, it took a while to get diagnosed um, after the, the foot, after the legs went asleep. Uh, that was, and they were just from the, you know, from the knee down, not, you know, not the whole leg. Oh. Um, and um, then it felt like I was standing on pebbles, even though I wasn't, it didn't matter if I was on carpet or on wood or the, you know, the car, anything. It just felt like I was standing on pebbles all the time. Um, then I, at one point I had that banding that you get sometimes where it feels like someone is squeezing your middle, um, but there's no one there. <laughs> um, so those were kind of my first symptoms, but I, I'm very fortunate. I have not had any optic issues at all. I have friends that have, but I have not had um, had any of, of that. So Good. I'm fortunate. Good. Okay, here's one from Randy. Uh, what advice do you have for someone who retired, speaking of the medical field, who's, uh, what advice do you have for someone who's retired in the medical field and wants to help giving back, but is having difficulty finding a group to help I'm a large advocate for health and well-being. Any suggestions? Well, sure. I mean, I think that, that there's a lot of people out there that would love to, to get advice uh, and to be part of a group. And so one of the, the groups, and you could form your own group, or you could you know, offer your services like to a community center, and not just a senior center, but an actual you know, community center where people of all ages, uh, because I think that, that wellness any kind of wellness talks. I mean, you could start at an elementary school, at a you could go to a junior high or a high school. I think there's so much need for for people to learn from others. Um, I know that a lot of my my friends. Um, I don't have any children myself, but a lot of my friends that do, I'm able to talk to them about things that their parents can't talk to them about. Um, mm -hmm. And I do a lot of financial planning for um, both you know nieces and nephews and friends. Kid, uh, you know young people to get them to start thinking about things that they haven't been taught about and haven't 
thought about yet. And I think wellness is one of those things. And whether it's through, um, you know, a community center or an actual um, meetup group or a church, uh, I think there's all kinds of places where talking about and forming a group with wellness would be just incredible. And the fact that you have the MD after your name makes it even more important. You know, whatever your name is, be Dr. Bob or Dr. Mike or whatever, and have it be friendly, have it be fun. And, and I bet you could have a following. Great, great, thanks. So um, here's one from Karen. What a phenomenal resource you are, so inspiring and encouraging. How can we contact you if we have questions about equipment or other resources? I don't know yeah. if you want to be contacted, but <laughs> that's a question. Yeah, I'm, I'm fine with that. I, you know, once, once you, I'm, I'm still in the phone book, believe it or not. There was a phone book. Go. If you call 411, you'll get my home number. But, <laughs> um, but I can, I don't know whether you want me to, um, I'm not very good at doing chat and also talking. So um, let's see, I, let me just give you my email address. Are you ready? It is h-fargo and the dash is like a hyphen, h-fargo at comcast.net. Okay, I'll put that in the chat. Great. You're very generous with that. And just okay. so people know, there, there are, um, there's a place called the Navigation Center through the MS Society, uh, and they will sometimes be able to help you. The, the problem with a group like that is because they get, you know, advertisements in their magazines and stuff from different wheelchairs or whatnot, um, they don't tend to want to give you advice. But for example, the first wheelchair I got through, uh, through my doctors or through the physical therapist, not my personal physical therapist, through UC Davis, um, it never occurred to me to ask, but it didn't fold. I've never even heard of a wheelchair that didn't fold, which means I couldn't put it in my car unless I took the wheels off. Yeah, so okay. Try having balance issues trying to take the wheels off of your wheelchair so you can stuff it in your car. I mean, it was absurd. That so it's my at-home wheelchair, but I had to go out and buy my own wheelchair when I wanted to go to China because I was gonna, I needed one that folded. I mean, how stupid is that? Yeah. Anyway. Next. All right, here's one from Cindy. Uh, wondering, as a strong, dynamic woman, if folks' attitude towards you changed as they realized you were dealing with MS and how you handled it. Yeah, I think that, that people definitely see people with disabilities differently. And I think it's, I probably overcompensate for it a little bit um, by staying active and staying assertive and um, not being dismissed. But, um, but yeah, people look at you differently as you age. They look at you differently with disability. And frankly, they look at you differently when you're a girl. So um it's always, you know, plus I'm only 5'3". Well, actually, now I'm only 5'2". But, you know, it's, um, you know, when you're short and you're older and you're disabled and you're a woman, it's like, eh, you know, yeah, you get you get dismissed a lot. But, you know, I'm, I challenge them back. Good. But I'm, I'm, I don't take it as easily as they might want to dish it out. All right. This one's from Nancy. Uh, what websites or blogs are good to research equipment as we develop the need to do to do so. You know that's a good question, and I don't know of one. Okay. I mean, I'm sure there's I, lots I, of them out there. I imagine there are. I would um, just so you know, my the wheelchair that I use is a Nova N O V A. Um, the person I go to is uh, Marion Medical, just south of Broadway. There's a guy there named Augie who's a real expert in some things, and you know, so I found more. him out, and he was really good. Um, there's another one I went to where they were very, um, the guy was just kind of mean, so I didn't go back. Um, you know, so, um, and then I think checking with people too, um, I think it's important that your wheelchair is lightweight, obviously strong enough for you, but as lightweight as possible and foldable. Uh, I think the same is true for a scooter. I mean, the one that you're going to be able to get from Medicare for free is the one that you might loan to a friend if they absolutely needed one. You could use it in your house, but you can't take it outside. It's too heavy. Um, you know, the ones that you have to break down where the lightest, heaviest part is 35, weighs as much as my entire scooter. Um, it's more comfortable, but it doesn't, won't get you where you need to go. And so it's, you just got to save up and you know, and, and buying used is okay. I mean, there are places with just sell used equipment and that's, they don't all like to do it because of the liability issues, but then there's Craigslist and places like that because they're uh, out there. 
Great. So here's one from your earlier career. Uh, what was the hardest decision you ever had to make as mayor? Oh, wow. <laughs> what would that be? I think probably one of the hardest decisions was, um, at least in terms of selling it, was the assessment we had to do for flood control. Um, it was I, it was it wasn't so hard and that I knew that that we needed to do it but selling it was hard there were people that actually in the unincorporated areas we, their fee was going to be three dollars I think a year and they were upset because they didn't want to have to pay for anybody who was so stupid to live in the floodplain of Sacramento um, and I think it was also challenging to try to dispel the myths of Natomas for example which everyone thinks is is unsafe because it used to flood. Well, it hasn't flooded since 1911 when they did the levees and the places that have flooded are Land Park and East Sacramento, uh, South well, Sacramento. Climate, cha climate change is upon us, so uh, they may not have much longer. <laughs> yeah, so I don't know. So we, you know, I think the levee work, certainly it, it took, I mean, I was on the flood control board for 19 years and we're still not done with that. So that was probably the most, you know, it was, it was very complicated. You were having to deal with men in uniform a lot. It's always challenging. Every man in a uniform, whether it's sports, police, fire, Army Corps of Engineers, difficult. Um, so I think those were probably one of the hardest. That and the labor union stuff, I, I was not a big, that was always very difficult doing um, labor negotiations uh, and doing also redistricting. That was hard when you had to change the district boundaries and move yeah. neighborhoods from one neighborhood to another. That was hard. Yeah. All right. Uh, this one's from Paul. Do you have a food diet for consuming foods that don't cause inflammation or even reduce inflammation? Um, yes, I do. I, I try to follow it. I'm not as good at following it as I should. Um, but there are some diets that are designed for people with MS. I've tried some of those, and in all honesty, they never actually... I mean, you know, they're not a cure. Um, although I think that diet is incredibly important because with, with MS or any chronic disease, you don't need something else to go wrong. So I think it's important. I, I, have, I eat very little red meat. Um, I do mostly whole grains if I'm gonna, I, I stay away from white rice and, and very little white pasta, lots of vegetables, lots of fruits. I, I go to the farmer's market and eat a variety of colors of food on a regular basis. Um, and then what else? I still have to have some chocolate and some cookies sometimes. I uh, have very little dairy. I, I don't like cookies at all, so I guess I wouldn't want that. You don't like cookies? Oh <laughs> no. Call me the cookie monster. Oh, okay. Oh. So anyway, so that's pretty much what I do. Uh, it, it's a pretty, pretty classic. It's not one particular, you know, it's obviously the Mediterranean diet and, and, and I, I tend to go more vegetarian. Uh, chicken is probably the main meat that I eat uh, in addition to fish. So I try to, to follow the, you know, the Dr. Wheel uh, pyramid. Uh, he's got a great website, W-E-I-L. Um, and then I do read about all the stuff more than I actually probably follow it in terms of all the micronutrients I'm supposed to have and, and all of that stuff. But uh, but I work on it and I try and I do think it matters. So I encourage you to pay attention to that. Good. So here's a follow up to the Natomas uh, thing. Uh, Ruth asks, living down the street, I know I speak for my neighbors when I thank you for continuing to advocate for South Natomas. Oh. Uh, I know you've done international travel. Can you describe some of that travel? Oh, yeah. Um, well, I got to go, I don't know why, but for some reason it, it jumped to my mind. I got to go to Israel, which was very interesting. Um, the, the Israeli uh, government actually invites 80 mayors from around the world, or no, 40 mayors from around the world, uh, every year to go to Jerusalem and tour around Israel. Uh, so they can ex under explain to people the situation. And that was a, a fascinating trip. And there were only eight mayors from the United States, and I was the only one from west of the Mississippi. But there were mayors there from, you know, Africa and Asia and, and South America. And it was, a, it was a fascinating tour. And really, uh, you know, to be able to meet the mayor of Prague, for example, was incredible. Um, I, I did get to go to Japan, uh, to our sister city there, and I was part of the U.S.-Japan Conference of Mayors, where we uh, worked on both climate change issues as well as peace issues, which was great. 
Um, I got to go to China with another group of, uh, with the League of California Cities when I was the president of that group. And we met with a number of leaders in China and talked about issues like, like environmental issues and, um, you know, civil rights issues and things like that. It was a, an incredible opportunity uh, to be able to do that. And of course, we entertained a lot of people from other countries here. Uh, Sacramento, I believe, now has nine sister cities that do come uh -huh. here, plus other people from around the world visit right. on a regular basis. Um, and I was able to go to Scotland to speak to them about, um, they invited me to come after I was mayor to talk about um, the value of mayors and the value of downtown districts, because Scotland, as you know, is not independent from the UK and they send all their money to Westminster. And so they wanted to keep some of their money and the only mechanism they had um, was uh, to be able to do a, a downtown district and bring in their revenue from their downtown areas. And of course, uh, we did the first one in California here in Sacramento um, when I was, was, um, was on the council. And, and that started the whole being able to, to charge your property owners an assessment to help provide services for the area instead of just the business owners. And there's, you know, frankly, more money with property owners than business owners. So we were able to tap into that and, uh, and just being able to share what we do here that there's a lot of, um, of, uh, of conversations between mayors around the world and certainly here in the United States. And, and my trips to Washington and other cities here uh, through the US Conference of Mayors was, was just wonderful in terms of learning what they did. And um, I remember when, when we had, uh, George Bush wasn't interested in going to the Kyoto Protocol. So we mayors got together and we sent mayors to the Kyoto, to Kyoto on behalf of the United States to let the other countries know that we really did care <laughs> and nice. we were going to do something, so. That's great, that's yeah. great. Um, back to the depression question. Uh, this is from Karen. Uh, do you have a counselor or a support group that you use? Um, I have friends that I use and my physical therapist is probably the closest thing that I have to a counselor right now. Um, I've been thinking that it might be interesting and you should have someone, you should try to locate for one of your upcoming speakers, someone who is actually a grief counselor. Because I think the whole process of aging with or without a disability is a process of loss. Uh, and, oh. and, and grieving is something that I think we don't necessarily do well or do well with others. Uh, and, and maybe there's some tools there that we could all benefit from. Um, but it's mostly through, through my friends that, that, I, um, that I talk to about things, things like that. Okay. Um, well, well, that good suggestion. We'll look into that for future forums. Um, let's see, how, it's an interesting question from Amy. Have you spoken with uh, either Linda Ronstadt or Annette Funicello? Linda Ronstadt, yes. Annette Funicello, I never met. But Linda Ronstadt, actually, we have a mutual friend, which is interesting. Um, Linda Ronstadt has Parkinson's as opposed to MS. Annette Funicello had, had MS. And so does Terry Garr. And Terry Garr wrote a book. And this is part of the humor you have to use when you have a sit-down comedy routine. She didn't use this, but the title of the book that she wanted to use was, Does, Wh does This Wheelchair Make My Butt Look Fat? <laughs> <laughs> that was a great title. That's great. That's great. All right. Um, let's see. One from Cindy. Uh, tell us about your professional deliberations over the King's Arena with oh. the Maloofs. <laughs> oh, my God. I don't think we have enough time. Um, <laughs> they were very difficult, very immature, um, very unreasonable. Um, I remember the last time I met with them, at the arena, um, the first, yeah, at the first arena when they wanted to do, to build a bigger one. Um, I remember leaving and saying to myself and to my chief of staff at the time, I am never going to their house again. <laughs> and um, after that, they had to meet me at city hall because they were so unpleasant to deal with. Um, you know, private sports owners um, in general, it seems like the game is to figure out how do you get the public sector to pay for your hobby. Uh -huh. uh, and I think that's kind of true across the board um, that 
you know, here you've got people that consider themselves whales or billionaires, and they're asking the city to waive permit fees when, when people building yeah. affordable housing don't get to waive permit right. fees. Right. Um, but it's like a lot of things in the development world and, and at City Hall is I always said, well, you know, they get to ask. But that doesn't mean we have to say yes. Right. And the hardest thing I think at City Hall wasn't being able to say yes to people, but it was getting the votes to say no. Super. All right. Well, Heather, this has been a fantastic hour. Uh, you're so inspirational. Thank you very much for what you've done. <laughs> thank you for that. Uh, in your past and in your present and today. It's all been wonderful. So thank you for the Renaissance Society. And I think we're gonna um, tie this up. Uh, you've answered a tremendous number of questions and they all appreciate it. Thank well, you. Thank you, Tom, for handling the questions. Thanks to your audience for the inspiring questions. And I uh, hope I was able to, to do a presentation that met your expectations. Uh, thank you again for inviting me and giving me this opportunity. Did a great job. Thank you again. Okay, bye. Heather, before we let you go, yes, um, we want to talk a little bit about the Walk MS sure. uh, coming up, and that is not tomorrow, but a week from tomorrow. Right. It's a virtual event, and I just want to call attention to the WalkMS.org website. Yes. And uh, talk a little bit more about um, uh, what the event is all about, as you did in the past. Sure. The, the, the walk is about raising money for the National MS Society. Uh, and because of COVID, this is our second year in a row of doing it as a virtual event. Um, but it, it's still an event. It's still a fundraiser. And we're still hoping we raised as much money last year as we had done in the past. Uh, we raised close to $200,000 usually at the Sacramento MS event. Um, and because they're all happening on one day this year uh, nationally, uh, this is the day. Uh, if you go to walkms.org to that website, uh, you can look for my name if you want to donate in my name or if you want to just donate in general, that's fine too. But uh, my name is there and I'm usually one of the top 10 fundraisers in the Sacramento area. Um, and that's it's pretty easy you just you look for the you look for sacramento yeah for sacramento first and then i believe it's for my name right. and uh, you can donate online and they also will have an address there if you want to write a check and mail something in and there is a phone number i might as and well there's a phone number you can use that phone number as well it's 855-372-1331 if you want to jot it down yes okay. thank you thanks very much heather and thank you all. Thank you also for the uh, very inspiring presentation and the various generous presentation as well. I enjoyed it very much, and I'm sure everybody did. And as a token of our appreciation, Heather, the Renaissance Society has made a $25 donation in your name to the Seth Nelson Emergency Grant Fund on behalf of those students who are struggling and may be in need of financial assistance. So. Thank, thank you, you very much. I've given to them in the past and will get in the future. But thank right. you for doing that on my behalf. Thank you very much. Folks, as a reminder, today's presentation was recorded for your convenience. And uh, there are a couple of ways that you can access it. There's that, uh, sorry, there's that self -no Seth Nelson slide. Uh, you can view today's program on the Renaissance Society forum channel on YouTube or you may go to the Renaissance Society website as well. Uh, next Friday, we have a very good um, opportunity to hear from Adam Steinhauer. He is the um, editor-in-chief of um, the um, uh, a, a Sacramento newspaper here in town, the Business Journal. And his uh, uh, presentation will be on taking the pulse of Sacramento's business scene in the era of COVID. Should be very interesting uh, hour for us at that point as well. So with that in mind, thank you very much everybody for joining. Uh, it's gonna be close to 90 degrees this weekend. Stay cool and have a tremendous weekend. Thank you.